inhabit the parched places of the wilderness in the salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the water and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when the heat cometh but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Verse 13, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Behold, they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee, neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest that which cometh out of my lips was right before thee. Be not a terror unto me. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. Let them be confounded that persecute me, but let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed, but let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with double destruction. Amen. This is a terrible verse in the Bible. I Maybe a better way to put it is a terrifying verse because uh, this is the way God feels about sin. He may let it go on for a long time. But the Spirit of God feels this way about sin. He says, let them be dismayed, bring upon them the day of evil, and destroy them with double destruction. My text tonight for a few minutes will be double destruction. Amen. Now we have an alternative to double destruction, and that is God's complete salvation. Hallelujah. You see, if we don't accept God's way and God's will for our life, we will come under this awful curse of double destruction and be cursed with a curse. Now, look at verse 13 through 14. He says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. A double blessing. Amen. Did you notice he said, Heal me and I shall be healed, and save me and I shall be saved? We'll either have a double blessing or a double curse. Those are the alternatives. We can make our choice which one we want to have tonight. Uh, the Spirit of God calling us and prompting us and begging us and pleading us. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how that God has to beg and plead and stretch out his arms all day long. That's what he said. He said, all day long I've stretched out my hand. Did you ever try to keep your hand stretched out any length of time? Did you just ever try to hold your arm out any length of time? You can't hold out very long. You think you can hold out all day long, but you'll be lucky to hold it ten minutes, five minutes at the most probably. But it, you can't hold it out very long. It's very tiring to hold your arm out very long at a time. But he said, all day long, tirelessly, God has begged and pleaded men to accept his salvation. Just think of it. God's trying to save people out of hell, and they don't pay no attention to him. God's trying to rescue people, and they won't get right with God. They won't repent of their sins and make an effort. God stretches out his hand all day long, and he's not lost. God stretches out his hand all day long, and, and he don't have to do that. All day long, he stretches out his hand to disobedient and gainsaying people. Praise God. Don't you think it's time that we responded to the call of God? Amen. Complete salvation, a double blessing. God wants to save us, and brother, when he does it, we'll be saved. When God saves us, we'll be saved. I've told a story uh, 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 before about Jack Cole getting in jail in, in Miami, Florida for uh, 
uh, practicing medicine without a license. He, he was really praying for the sick, but they, they put him in jail because he wouldn't close down the meeting. And, and he, uh, Jack Cole told this, he said, there was an old drunk uh, in the cell next to him, and he says, Howdy, preacher. And uh, he says, I don't believe I know you. He said, Oh, yes, you know me. He said, You saved me in your meeting the other night. And there they both was in jail, and Jack Coe said, You look like somebody I might have saved. You know, uh, man can't save us. It takes God to save us. Praise God. God. Jeremiah said, Lord, you save me, and I'll be saved. Yeah, we're looking for a, a red-hot evangelist and a high-powered preacher, praise God, to pour salvation down our throat, uh, open up our mouth, open up our mind or something, and, and, and to save us. But uh, we'll not get saved without our cooperation. We're going to have to seek God, amen, and he's the only one that can save. And he said, heal me, and I shall be healed. Hallelujah. When God does it, it's done right. God does, he does a good job. God healed me of bleeding ulcers over 20 years ago. Praise God. Driving back from Mobile, Alabama, closed my meeting out early. Had, uh, had a, 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 a terrible virus, and, and I'd had trouble with peptic ulcers. At least they'd flare up every once in a while. And, and I went to that revival with a, a, a bottle of Pepto-Bismol sitting in the seat in my car. Amen. And on the way down, oh, I felt like I missed the Lord. And, and I felt like when I got across, down about the Tennessee border, across the Tennessee line, I just felt like turning around and going back to Alto Pass. And I felt like I was missing the Lord, but my word was out. I had promised Brother Harley I would come. And if I promise anybody I'll do anything, I'll do it. I'll be found doing it or I'll die trying to do it. Amen. And so I told him I'd come and I, I was on my way. Amen. I preached the week with the flu. When I ought to have been getting better, I, I was getting worse. The pains in my stomach were getting worse. An intestinal virus, I thought. Amen. And uh, uh, I, I, been, I began then that ulcer. It, it just seemed like it took over where the flu left off. And one aggravated the other. And uh, a, a terrible thing. I just walking around all bent over. All day long, laying around most of the time. And then I began to hemorrhage, pure black blood. And the life was gradually ebbing out of my body. And I told him I'm going to have to close the meeting. And I've got to go home while I'm able to drive. He wanted me to go to the hospital. But I knew if I went to the hospital, they'd make me drink chalk. And they'd take x-rays. And they'd test me upside down and backwards. I'd prayed for too many people in the hospital. Had the same thing I had. And I knew what they'd do, and I was like the little black boy that uh, couldn't afford to have appendicitis, so he just had the bellyache instead. Amen. And, and I couldn't afford to go to the hospital, and so I closed the revival out and went home while I could drive, and I headed up the road in my 59 Buick, 85 miles an hour, brother. Amen. I was in uh, hurry to get home while I was still able to set up and drive. And I began to pray, and I prayed, and I repeated the promises of God in the devil's face. And I claimed the promises of God. Amen. I, be, I fasted all the way home. That's the wrong thing to do with ulcers. Uh, you, you just drink a whole lot of milk and eat a lot of, of food, you know, and, and uh, try to stay full all the time so they won't grind against each other. Amen. And uh, I went home fasting and a praying that day. On the way home, I prayed through, and God healed me, and I've never had any trouble since. I had to get victory over ulcers every year. Amen. After the youth camp, Granite City, uh, the tension and, and uh, everything, I'd, I'd have another flare-up, and the deacons and the elders would have to pray for me, and God would have to heal me. But praise God, the Lord healed me once and for all. Twenty years ago, praise God, eat anything Lord, have mercy. God has been so good. Praise God. Never had any trouble. After I prayed through on the way home, in two days I was as good as new, back, uh, just like I'd never been sick, back to work again. Amen. And uh, doing the work of the Lord. Hallelujah. God said, uh, uh, Jeremiah said, Heal me, Lord, and I shall be healed. Praise God. Uh, uh, somewhere along in here, 
he uses that word blessed. Uh, blessed. Blessed is the man, he said in the seventh verse. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. Now God, when he saves you, does a good job and he heals you, does a good job and he gives you happiness. Isn't it amazing how the Lord, he's got to stand all day long with outstretched hand trying to give us happiness. And we're trying to find it some other way except God's way. Hallelujah. God's extending the world happiness all day long. He stretches out his hand trying to give them what they're looking for. And they're spending their money for that which is not happiness. Spending money for that which is not bread. Amen. They're not getting their money's worth in these days. I uh, never have as far as that goes. When men have rebelled against God, they never get their money's worth. God's the one that has true happiness. He said, blessed. That's what the word blessed means. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. Amen. Uh, here's where men seek sometimes. The fifth verse, he said, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed is the man that trusteth in man. He can't save you. He, he can't heal you. Amen. You know, Asa made the mistake in his sins instead of repenting and getting right with God so God could heal him. He, he went to the physicians of the land and he died. Amen. Now, there's nothing wrong with a proven remedy and a, a good uh, physician that uh, uh, will help you with your problem. Amen. But you don't want to never trust man before God. And a lot of people run here and there and another place because they're running from God. They don't want to yield to God. But all you've got to do is yield your life to God and surrender all to Jesus and everything will be all right. Most people tonight in the hospital don't have to be there. Seventy percent of the people, and maybe more if the truth was known, but they say statistically that seventy percent of the people are spiritually sick, and that's the reason they're in the hospital. Amen. And uh, if, we'll, if we'll trust the Lord and come to God, and surrender to Him, and surrender to God's will for our life, we'll have a lot less trouble, and we'll be the easiest people to doctor in the world. Because when we, when we are doctored, we will respond. Amazing thing about it is, people today that are running to the physician, they've got insurance policies, and they've got uh, uh, escape machines, and escape... Uh, 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 instruments today that they can run from God with. And they can try other things instead of trying God and seeking God's will first. And so the fifth verse gives us a warning, Thus saith the Lord. I don't make any difference what I say. If I don't preach the word of God, it's not worth a nickel. I've got to preach the word of God. He said, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. He goes on to say, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Praise God. We need to seek God. That's what's wrong with the world tonight. They need to seek God. Amen. That's what's bankrupting the nation tonight. They need to seek God. They want more money so they can have more sin, because sin is costly. They want more money so they can party more, so they can have more whiskey, more drugs, and more wine, women, and song. Amen. And they use money as an instrument for departing from the living God. And when they don't get enough money, they strike for higher wages, more money, more wages. Until today, the modern labor union has priced America out of the world market. Amen. And we're in a depression in a recession, in breakneck inflation, amen, because of our sins. Hallelujah. That's right. We want more money so we can buy more sin and have more leisure time to run away from God to the lake and to the park and to the amusement centers of this world. Amen. 
to delve into and revel in the luxuries of this world. Amen. Now, God wants us to have good things. God wants us to have the best. Amen. But the best way in the world to bankrupt in poverty is sin. Amen. I used to see pictures on the wall of my grandpa, great-grandpa, and great-grandma, and some of my ancestors way back. And you know, they had white shirts on, and they had suits on, and they had neckties on. And I've never seen any of my family, any of them, ever dress up in anything much more than a pair of khakis or a, pair, a new pair of overalls and a new shirt, and they're dressed up. Amen. And that, uh, you see, when I came along, born in the middle of the Depression, sin had taken its toll in my family, and there was a lot of poverty and a lot of nakedness and a lot of misery and a lot of suffering. Amen. But in spite of that fact, most of them still are not living for God. Amen. It's a terrible thing. Sin brings a nation down. Sin brings families down. And sin brings individuals down. I never had anything till I started living for God. Praise God. I never, I never made any progress until I started living for God. Amen. The Bible said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. Hey, you know, you start living for God, then the devil come along and he'll tempt you to try to lure you away. I just got saved, filled the Holy Ghost, and started preaching. And that, that takes over a period of about two years. I just started preaching. And uh, one day Earl Ellis, the neighbor, I was walking down the road, uh, came down to see me, and uh, I was 17 years old and just started preaching the gospel and didn't hardly have a penny to my name. Amen. Not hardly a penny to my name. When I started preaching, I didn't have one necktie. When I started preaching, I didn't have one white shirt. I did not have one suit. Amen. When I bought the first clothes I had to preach in, I bought a blue pair of gabardine trousers, and, and a shirt that, that was, uh, uh, was not a, a, it wasn't a white shirt. It was kind of a, a multicolored, striped kind of a thing. And a tie that didn't much match. Amen. And, and a little old short jacket. I didn't know any better. Amen. I put that on thought I was dressed up. Amen. Uh, when I started preaching, I didn't have no clothes to preach in much. Amen. Now you can imagine, you know, that poor and and uh, that much, you know, behind as the way the world goes. And Earl Ellis came down. Earl Ellis was a clerk, a mail clerk on Frisco Railroad. At that time, you know, the railroad hauled much of the mail. And, uh, and they started it on those trains as they, as they went down the line. And so, uh, you know, the old railroad station had a bag out there and a train. If the train didn't stop, it could grab it. It had an arm out there to grab it as it went by. Amen. Hang it out there, and that arm would grab that mail bag. And so Earl Ellis, he was a neighbor uh, gentleman, and uh, he was a mail clerk. And he had an opening for a mail clerk on Frisco Railroad. I was 17 years old, had just got through the 11th grade in high school. And he said, we have an opening for a mail clerk, and I can get you the job. And I'd already consecrated my life to God. And already sold out to Jesus. Year, just, well, about a year or so before that, I'd totally and completely sold out to Jesus. And uh, I began to question. It was a big temptation. If I'd taken that job back in 1951, amen, about 1951, I think it was, when he offered me that job, I would have been making $60 a week. Now, that was good money in 1951. $60 a week was real good money for anybody. Uh, that working on a job to make $60 a week. Brother, that was big money in 1951. And uh, I would have been making as much money as my dad. Oh, that was a big temptation. I had one question asked. I said, do you have to work on Sunday? And he said, yes. He said, uh, the, the trains, they, they run on Sunday. Sometimes we're, we're gone from home as much as two weeks, but uh, not much more, he said, than, than two weeks. And, and I said, I can't do it because... He'd keep me out of the house of God 
on Sunday. I was going to preach the gospel, folks. I was going to preach the gospel, and I didn't take the job. Praise God. You know what? In a few years, my dad, he, he wanted me to take that job. He said, I always hoped that you could have something like that, son. And I didn't take the job. In just a few years, just a very few years, the oil burners took over the diesel jobs. Amen. And knocked out the roundhouse at Fair, Missouri. And they just about discontinued all passenger service. On Frisco Railroad, they quit all passenger service. And that knocked the mail cars off. Amen. Put the mail on trucks. My dad was without a job. I would have been without a job. But by that time, I'd already pastored my first church and was on the field full time for God. Amen. And I got the best job in the whole world. Preaching the gospel. Thank God. Oh, yeah. I never had anything until I started living for God and serving Jesus. Praise God. Oh, God's blessed. He'll bless people that'll trust the Lord. You may have some uh, transition times of transition. That was mine right there. And the temptation comes in your time of transition. Praise God. But don't trust in man. Don't trust in things. But trust in God. Verse 7 and 8 said, Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit the blessing of trusting God. Amen. It's a double blessing. It's a blessing in this life, and it's a blessing in the life to come. We get saved. We have eternal life, folks. Everybody you look at today, they're dying. They're not going to live very long. Uh, up till the flood, men lived sometimes around a thousand years. Amen. And it was proven that men, by living a long time like that, it didn't help them to know any more. It didn't help them to do any better. In fact, they did worse. Their, all their thoughts and all their imaginations were continually evil. Uh, God found out if he let men live a thousand years, they became thousand-year-old sinners and a thousand times over more wicked. If they live a thousand years. After the flood, God cut it down. Some of them lived up toward 300 years. Amen. But it gets shorter and shorter until it cuts down in Abraham's day to less than 200 years. In Moses' day, it's just around 100 years. Moses lived 120 years. Amen. Until you get down to David's day, God got it cut down to three score and ten, seventy years. Everybody you look at is dying. And you know they can't find any biological reason why men should die. They say the way the human body is constructed, it ought to live forever. It's built to repair itself. It's built to renew itself. It's built in every way to live on and on and on. And it mystifies the biologist, a bi biologist, uh, amen, and, and, and the, the scientists today that men die. And they're trying to find a way to keep men living longer and longer, but they can't do it. They're still dying. You know the reason men die? Because of sin. That's why. You know, God intended for man to be as eternal as the sun. God made man as ter eternal as the ground he walks on. God made man as eternal as the universe. God made man as eternal as himself. But he sinned. He sinned and he died. And that's what brought death upon the race. But now, praise God, God offers a deal to humanity. If you come back to God and accept God's plan for salvation, he said, if you'll believe on me, you'll never die. And once again tonight, if you're saved, you're as eternal as the sun. If you're saved, praise God, you're as eternal as the universe. If you're saved, you're as eternal as God and as eternal as Jesus Christ because you'll never die. Amen. You may shed this old body for a while and go to sleep, but God don't call that death for the child of God. Why? Because you're not separated from God. 
And whether we live or die, we're still the Lord's. That's why. Amen. The sinner dies because he's separated from God. The worst part of death is separation. Separation from God. Separation from life. And the child of God has a double blessing. He has a blessing that comes in this life, and he has a blessing of eternal life in the world to come. A double bound blessing. Amen. This life, he'll be like a tree planted by the water. Spread without her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat cometh. It don't make any difference what goes on in the world. God will help his people. It don't make any difference how depressed, how much recession we have. God will help his people. You watch it. God will take care of his people. God's going to take care of those Christians in Poland. He'll help them. Amen. The God of the fiery furnace will help them. The God that landed in a fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and went to the lion's den with Daniel will help his people in the time of trouble. It's going to be all right for the child of God that lives for the Lord. Praise God. So a double blessing. Saved and healed. Happiness and peace. Amen. Uh, the blessing in this life and the blessing in the world to come are double destruction. Listen to Jeremiah's prayer. Let them be confounded that persecute me. But let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed. But let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with double destruction. You say, how can a God of love... Don't you think Jeremiah was in the wrong spirit? No. Because that's what God's going to do. Remember that rich man that said, I'm going to tear down the barns and build bigger ones? Amen. And I'm going to fill my barns with all my goods and say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry. You've got much goods laid up for many days. Amen. And at that very night, God said to him, God spoke to him. You believe God still talks to men? He talked to that man. You know what God said to him that night? He said, Thou fool! Thou fool! Amen. Thy soul's going to be required of you this night. My, my, my. And he asked him a question. Then, who shall those things be? Who shall they be? That's destruction number one. Amen. God takes away everything that men have worked for in this life. Amen. Takes them away from them. Everything they sweated for, they lose it. Everything they've looked forward to, everything they've saved, it's gone. Destruction number one. Amen. Terrible to hear about those homes in California sliding right off the mountainside. Terrible to hear about people being buried in mud. How would you like to strangle to death, suffocate in mud? Terrible things. That four, over 400 homes in California destroyed. Why? Built on the sand. Amen. Did you know that everything that men built just about is built on the sand? Oh, if the rain don't get it, the lightning will. Amen. If they don't get it, the wind will. If one don't get it, the other will. If the flood don't get it, the fire will. Destruction. God has ordained destruction. Every civilization that rose up without God, God destroyed them. All we've got is a few marble pillars and a few carvings to tell us of the destruction of kingdoms of sin. They're going down. Amen. Terrible thing for a person to be uh, cascaded off of a mountain and then the whole home and them laying in the bed buried in mud and suffocated in a mud grave. That's no worse than your destruction if you rebel against God. He won't be a nickel's worth of deliverance. Difference. 
on the other side of the veil of death, no matter how you go. It don't make any difference if it slid off a mountain in California or was swallowed up in the earth in Florida. Amen. It don't make any difference how it happens. It's going to lose it. Everything in the world that men strive for, they're going to leave it behind. You know, after a while, there's going to be a lot of Christians get to judgment and they're going to weep and cry because they put too much on themselves. Not nothing, the work of God. They're going to be sorry they spent so much on themselves, not enough in the work of God. I told a story the other night uh, about when my, my grandfather begged Mom one of those beautiful handmade quilts. Mom would make those blocks by hand, sew them, set and sew for days. In her spare time, take the scraps from, from uh, 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 an old scrap box and make those beautiful flowery-like quilt blocks. Hand stitched. Didn't even have a sewing machine. And then, as she got the top made, she would stretch that out on a rack uh, with the, with some cotton uh, that they bought at the store, a thin layer of cotton. And she'd take some old white flour sacks, uh, amen, and sew them together and make the back of that quilt. Put that cotton between those blocks, or between those at top, and that back that she'd bleached out or dyed to whatever color she wanted and made a quilt out of it and pieced around every one of those blocks all the way through that quilt, stitched it by hand. Amen. Oh, the toil of men for the things they enjoy. Amen. That day, Grandpa came by to visit Mom. She was, re uh, she was recovering from the operation and uh, uh, he begged her for that newest quilt that she had. She didn't give it to him. They left and walked on over the hills. Amen. And it already getting winter time, getting season changing already. Uh, <clears throat> leaves already falling. Amen. Our house burned down just a few minutes after Grandpa had left. And that quilt was gone. If she'd have given that to Grandpa, that would have been the only thing that we saved in that house. And you know, that's all we're going to save in this world, what we put in the work of God, what we give to God. What we put on ourselves and keep, we're going to lose it all. And the wicked, the people that go on in this world in rebellion against God, they're going to lose everything. But that's not all of it. Amen. After they lose all they've worked for in this world, then they go to hell. That's double destruction, folks. That's losing it all on this side and losing eternal life on the other side. And that's what Jeremiah's talking about. He said, bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with destruction. Cursed in this world and cursed in the world to come. The fire will burn the earthly good. If you don't get it one time, it'll get it another time. Someday the element's going to melt with a fervent heat. Amen. But that's bad enough. To, do, to lose everything in the world is bad enough. But then to lose your soul in hell fire. What do you want out of life? Sinner, why do you want out of life? Why are you rebelling against God? More money? Why? So you can buy more things? Why? So you can have a good time? Why? Where are you going? Amen. What's going to happen to you? What if tonight you had all the money that you could put in this room? You could swim in it. You could throw it over your head. You could buy anything you wanted to in this world. What good would it do you? You wouldn't be happy because there'd be nothing left to look forward to. Millionaires are not happy. Billionaires are not happy. Men that get a lot of money in this world, you know what they want? They want power then. You know, spend millions of dollars to become president of the United States so they can have power. Because money don't mean anything much after you get it. 
Amen. Got to have power. After you get power, then you notice when men get in power, they get gray-headed quick. They look old and haggard quick. Amen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It'd be a fast way to the grave today to become president of the United States. Power don't help too much. Power don't make people happy. Amen. They're not enjoying life. How would you like to have to walk down the street every day with six big men guarding you to keep somebody from shooting you? Amen. When you went to bed, you had six big men guarding you. When you went to the garden, you had six men, big men guarding you. When you went to take a ride in the car, you had to have a car big enough for six big men. Amen. No matter where you go, you got to have six big men. Take care of them. Amen. After a while, you realize that the Democalian sword hangs over the head of those that have gained power. Double destruction, all the power, all the money that men can heap up, they're going to lose it all. Kennedy lost it all. Bobby lost it all. Amen. Down the line, they lost it all. My, my, my. But it's terrible to lose it in this world, and it's terrible to lose your soul and go to hell and burn forever after being a loser in life to be a loser in eternity. How sad. Double destruction. Amen. The rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torment, the Bible said. He lost it all in this world. And then he opened his eyes up in hell. He lost what he'd heaped up to the flame and the oxidization of time. And he lost his soul to the flame of hell. Amen. Come tonight and get saved. Surrender your all to God. And when you do, you've just begun to live. Let's pray. Father, bless the message tonight. Save some soul tonight. Help people, Lord, to surrender all to Jesus. Help them realize, Lord, that wealth and pleasure and fun and things are transient and passing. And soon they're gone. Oh, help people to see the falsity and the deceitfulness, Lord, of the so-called good life that's portrayed on the media today that people would like to find. And oh, help people to realize that none of those people that are playing a part in those programs that they look at and those lives that are depicted that they'd so like to imitate that none of them are happy. None of them are blessed. Oh, God, tonight, and help people to run for refuge to the rock of ages, the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Stand with us. As we sing, we invite you to an altar prayer. We're all going to pray. Come on. Amen. Bring somebody. Let's all pray tonight. Wasted Oh,
turn around, Johnny is calling, he's calling you, from a life of wasted years, search for wisdom and peace, understand Turn around, turn around.